Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Eikhoff, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Alumni Relations here at John Carroll University. Thank you for joining us for our first virtual scholarly luncheon. We're excited to have you join us for this opportunity to connect with one of, our, of JCU's outstanding faculty members. Over the course of the last year, the Office of Alumni Relations and John Carroll University has worked to create innovative and interesting programming for our alumni, current students, parents, faculty, staff, alums, uh, children, and friends, so we can keep them engaged with the university while we cannot gather together. Today's scholarly luncheon is just one more example of how JCU is sharing the expertise of its faculty, staff, and alumni with our broader community. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ralph Soporto, PhD, our featured faculty member for today's virtual scholarly luncheon. Dr. Ralph A. Soporto is the Associate Professor of Biology at John Carroll University. He teaches courses in biodiversity, tropical biology, and human anatomy and physiology, and serves as the Graduate Program Director in Biology. He is also a chemical uh, ecologist with more than 15 years of experience studying brightly colored poison frogs in tropical rainforests. His research involves field-based studies in Central and South America, as well as experimental work in his research laboratory at John Carroll. He's an active research program that includes both undergraduate and graduate students, and he has served as the major thesis advisor for more than 15 graduate students. He has published more than 60 peer-reviewed research articles on the chemistry, ecology, evolution, behavior, and natural history of poison frogs. He regularly presents his research findings at scientific conferences, and his published work is highly collaborative and involves numerous students. Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if you give me one second. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this. Oops. I'm going to try to get the laser pointer to work. Okay. So thank you again for the uh, introduction and thank you everybody for, for coming today. Um, I've been at John Carroll for about 12 years um, and you know, I teach classes as Eric said, um, but I also have an active research program. And um, what I wanna do today is talk to you a little bit about what we do uh, in my lab. Um, Eric also said that I'm a, I'm a chemical ecologist and that's true. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in how frogs use color um, and chemicals to defend themselves from predators, but also to protect themselves from disease. Um, most of my field work is in the tropics, so I'm also a tropical biologist. Uh, and I do quite a bit of work in uh, Costa Rica, Panama, and Brazil. Um, today, what I want to do is basically share with you a story um, about a group of frogs that are called poison frogs. Um, I've studied these frogs for the past about 20 years. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what poison frogs are, um, tell you a little bit about their poisons, and um, more importantly, how they become poisonous. Um, and along the way, I want to share with you some of uh, the research that goes on uh, basically in my lab. So. I want to begin, though, by uh, saying that most of the research that I'm going to talk about today involves students. Um, and these are students that have uh, been in my lab for the past 12 years. Well, they haven't been in the lab for 12 years, but students that have um, been a part of this research. And so as I talk about this, I, I want to say thank you to those students. Um, these are students that have come to the field with me. These are students that work uh, in the lab with me currently. And so again, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, certainly all of the new things, um, all involves uh, students here at John Carroll. So I'll begin with the, the star of the show here, and these are uh, poison frogs. Um, this is a, a relatively common species of poison frog. This is a Miriga trivitata. This is a species that's found mainly in South America. Um, poison frogs are, are brightly colored, um, and poison frogs have poisons, um, but they're relatively small. You can see uh, they range in size from about a half an inch to about two inches. Um, and to put that in perspective uh, with respect to a human, here is a poison frog, right? So these are, these are tiny frogs um, that, that um, I'm going to tell you a story about. Um, 
Trivitata is one of the species, but there are many species of poison frogs. Um, all of them collectively are, are brightly colored and poisonous. And so this is just um, you know, some of the diversity of, of colors that you can see of different species of poison frogs. Um, they're found worldwide. There are four major lineages of poison frogs. There are frogs that are found in Central and South America, Madagascar, as well as Australia. Um, most recently, uh, we've discovered um, an additional group of poison frogs that is unique to Cuba. Um, all of these frogs um, are again brightly colored and, and poisonous, and for the most part, they're found in tropical regions of the world. And so these are tiny frogs that are brightly colored and poisonous, but live in a really complex habitat, right? Tropical forests are extremely complex. Um, and this is where these frogs for the most part uh, live. Uh, poison frogs um, are poisonous because they contain alkaloids. And this is um, an alkaloid here. An alkaloid is basically an organic compound that has a nitrogen in its system. And so there's the nitrogen. Um, you're probably familiar with alkaloids. Um, some common alkaloids include caffeine, uh, which you would have in your coffee or tea. Um, and other alkaloids are tobacco, uh, which would be in um, you know, cigarettes, for example. So alkaloids are, are relatively common. Now, neither of those alkaloids are found in these frogs, um, but that just sort of gives you an idea of what an alkaloid um, is. In terms of the frogs, we've discovered over 1,400 different alkaloids. And so these are uh, some of the structures of those alkaloids. And you don't need to be a chemist here um, to appreciate that there is diversity in the types of alkaloids that these frogs have. Now, an individual frog um, has anywhere from five to 50 different alkaloids. So, um, you know, even within a frog, there's quite a bit of, of variation. Um, but this is what gives these frogs their, their poison. It's, it's these alkaloid compounds. Um, the alkaloids in the frogs are, are stored in their skin um, and they're stored in uh, poison glands. And so in this image here, we have um, a cross section of the skin and we're looking at it under a microscope and you can see three large poison glands. Um, so this is the, the skin layer here. Um, and they sequester um, all of their poison glands, uh, all of their alkaloids, sorry, into these poison glands. Each of these poison glands has a small duct that leads to the surface of the skin. And when the frog um, wants to release some of that poison, it contracts smooth muscle that surrounds these glands and it ejects the alkaloids onto the skin surface. And so if you were a predator who put one of these frogs in your mouth, um, you would get a mouthful of the alkaloid. The alkaloids themselves are toxic because they disrupt uh, normal ion channel function. Um, in um, general, uh, the physiology of, of vertebrates and invertebrates is such that um, normal, um, uh, uh, normal neuronal function and muscular function is due to the movement of ions in and out of cells. And so this is a, an example here. This is the, the neuromuscular junction. This is basically where neurons communicate with muscles. Um, and for that communication to happen, um, you've got a lot of protein channels that allow the movement of ions in and out of the cell, things like sodium channels and calcium channels. And what these alkaloids do is they bind to these channels and they disrupt their normal functioning. This can uh, lead to paralysis, this can lead to seizures, um, but basically they're shutting down or turning on these protein channels and this is what makes them toxic. There are a diversity of alkaloids, and so they do this a bunch of different ways, but this is uh, basically what makes them um, toxic. Now, the frogs themselves are actually pretty neat because they are um, able to deal with the fact that they have these compounds. The frogs have protein channels, just like you and I, um, 
But what the frogs have done is they've modified their ion channels. So this is just a, a cartoon of a sodium channel here. Um, sodium needs to move in and out of uh, muscle or nerve cells. And these are our protein channels and proteins are made of amino acids. Um, and so if you look more closely at what this protein um, channel is made up of, it is shown here. And what the frogs have done is they have modified different amino acids, and those are shown here in different colors. Um, and they've modified them such so that the alkaloids don't bind to the channels. And if the alkaloids can't bind to the channels, um, then the frogs um, are not intoxicated by the presence of these alkaloids. And so this is a pretty neat trick that the, that the frogs have. They can basically have these alkaloids, um, but don't have to deal with the toxic effects of the alkaloids. Now, some poison frogs are very poisonous. Um, and these are the ones that, that get all of the attention. Um, but what I wanna say and what I wanna be clear about is that although some of them are very poisonous, most of them just taste bad. Most of them um, don't taste good to predators and are not nearly as poisonous as you might think. But because everybody's interested in how poisonous poison frogs are, um, I wanna show you um, this, this uh, graph to show you how, what that looks like. Um, so when we talk about um, toxicity, um, we typically use mice to estimate toxicity. Um, and you can inject uh, toxins into mice and measure how much of that toxin you need to put in a certain number of mice um, to result in, in death. Um, and this is a graph just showing you some, some common poisons beginning here with cyanide. Um, everybody knows cyanide is not good for you. Um, everybody knows that cyanide can kill humans. Um, this uh, graph has a break here because um, cyanide is a lot less toxic than some of these other organisms. In fact, if you took cyanide and you had it um, basically be equivalent to a grain of salt, the toxicity of cyanide would be about 20 grains of salt in two liters of water, right? And so that's how much cyanide you would need to, to kill a human. Um, and, and this is you know, basically showing that graphically in terms of its toxicity. What you can see is that poison frogs, you need a whole lot less of their, of their poison. Um, in fact, poison frogs, at least some of them, are so to toxic that they're about 100 times more toxic than most venomous snakes. Right? And most people know snakes are venomous and bad and don't want to, to get bit by them. Um, some poison frogs are, are much more toxic than, than venomous snakes. Uh, we've also got puffer fish up here, which have a, a toxin called tetrodotoxin. Um, and then, of course, scorpions um, also being uh, venomous or, or poisonous in this case. So some poison frogs can be really, really poisonous. Um, but again, I want to reiterate that most of them just taste bad. Most of them are not nearly as poisonous as, as um, this graph would imply. Um, when we talk about poison frogs, there, there are these four main lineages, um, but the dendrobatids, the ones that are found in Central and South America, these are the ones that are most well studied. Um, these are the, the frogs that we study primarily uh, in my lab, um, and these are the frogs that I, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about. Um, the dendrobatids uh, represent over 300 different species. So there's quite a bit of diversity in this group. Um, and you might know them as the dart poison frogs. This is their, their common name. Um, and they're called dart poison frogs because they've been used in traditional hunting for, um, uh, they've been used in traditional hunting as dart poisons. Um, and this is from a paper in the late 1970s um, showing um, an Embera Indian from the Choco region of Colombia. This is on the western coast of Colombia, uh, using a, a blowgun, um, inserting a dart into that blowgun. Um, and they would use these to hunt for uh, birds and, and other mam and, and mammals, things like monkeys. Uh, but they would put the, uh, the tip of the dart onto these frogs to collect up some of the alkaloids, um, and then this was what penetrated whatever they were trying to consume. Now, the, 
um, Indians themselves didn't get intoxicated because they would cook the meat. Um, and by cooking the meat, you would destroy the alkaloids. And so they were able to, to eat this um, as food. Um, although dart poisoning um, is was used in traditional hunting. Um, the, the rifle overtook uh, blow darts relatively quickly. Um, and although these images are from the 1970s, um, dart poisoning isn't really used anymore today, um, thanks to the, to the um, introduction of the rifle. Um, the, the term dart poison frog though, which we use collectively to refer to this group of frogs is, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, and that's because Dart poisoning is really only known from three species, and in particular, this species, Phyllobates terribilis, the terrible poison frog. Um, it contains a, a very toxic compound called bertrachotoxin, which is among the most poisonous uh, substances in the world, and, and very, very little amounts of this toxin are enough to, to kill lots of, of organisms. Um, but the entire family, the entire group of frogs is referred to as dart poison frogs, um, largely because of this species. There are two other species um, in this genus, two other members of Phyllobates that have also been used in dart poisoning. But the other 320 species of poison frogs have never been used in dart poisoning. And so we refer to them as the dart poison frogs, but again, it's a uh, it's a bit of a, a misnomer because they're not all used in, in dart poisoning. Um, some uh, human health implications. Um, some, some of the alkaloids in these frogs um, appear to, to possibly have some, some um, impact maybe in, in human medicine. Uh, this is a frog, Epipetobetes uh, anthony. Uh, this is a frog from Ecuador. Uh, where in the 1970s, uh, compound known as epibatidine was discovered. This is kind of a cool alkaloid. It's got that nitrogen in the ring system here, but it's also got a chlorine, and that makes it somewhat um, unique in terms of frog alkaloids. Um, the, the story with epibatidine is that it's a really potent analgesic. It's a really potent uh, painkiller. It's about 100 or 200 times more potent than morphine. And so this is really cool, right? This is a drug that could potentially, or a compound that could be developed as a drug to be used as a, as a painkiller. Um, unfortunately, it's also super toxic. Um, and so if you use it as a painkiller, um, the pain killing effects only last as long as until you die. Um, there are many researchers trying to synthesize this compound and change the molecule so that it keeps its analgesic properties, uh, but remove the uh, toxic properties. What's also cool about epibatidine in terms of its pain killing is that unlike morphine, um, epibatidine is a non-opioid analgesic. And so that makes it actually quite interesting. There's research on its potential use um, to treat schizophrenia, Parkinson's, um, and possibly Alzheimer's. Um, and so um, this is um, a quite interesting alkaloid that is known um, from these frogs. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit um, about how poisonous or how poison frogs become poisonous, right? This is sort of the, the story that I wanna tell. And I wanna give a little bit of historical context on how we learned about how poison frogs become poisonous. Um, this is a poison frog here. Um, this is uh, a frog found in South America. Um, but what we have here is just a regular toad on the left. Um, and uh, toads are also poisonous. Um, toads are not poison frogs, but they are poisonous. They have glands on their skin. Um, but the thing about toads is that toads make their own poisons. Toads basically produce poisons and secrete them. And so when we first started to think about how poison frogs became poisonous, we just assumed that poison frogs made their own poisons. It made sense. Most frogs are poisonous. Certainly these toads are poisonous. And we know these toads make it. And so we assumed that that's what poison frogs did. But it turns out it wasn't that simple. And it's something that took about 30 years to figure out. It took 30 years to figure out how the heck poisonous frogs become poisonous. 
And when I say 30 years, I'm stretching the truth a little bit here. There wasn't a dedication to trying to understand exactly how poison frogs became poisonous for 30 years, but it took 30 years of research on and off to figure out, wait a second, maybe they don't make their own poisons. So I wanna talk a little bit about the history and sort of how we got to understand how they make their own poisons. Um, research on poison frogs began in the 60s. Um, in the 1960s, chemists were, were interested in the compounds in these frogs and um, were studying uh, you know, the, the physiological effects of the compounds, what they did, describing them in different species. Um, and so people started collecting the frogs. Um, and one of the things that they noticed right away was that captive frogs began to lose their alkaloids over time. So if you took a frog from the wild and you brought it into your lab, um, over the course of several years, they start to lose their alkaloids. And this was curious at the time. And you know, people wondered, well, you know, why are they losing their alkaloids? And really what the conclusion was back in the 60s and, and 70s was that the frogs were living a pretty cush life in the lab. There were no predators. There was nothing to stimulate the production of alkaloids. Um, and so people just thought, well, they lose them over time because they don't need to make them because nothing's trying to, to eat them. Um, there were, however, some researchers who said, well, if this is true, then we should be able to induce the production of these alkaloids. And so there are a series of experiments that were done in the 70s um, and, and the early 80s where researchers took frogs and tried to stress them out. They would change the lighting regime. They would um, put fake snakes in front of them, all kinds of funny things to try to, to, to basically get them to produce alkaloids. Um, and they never could. They never could get them to produce alkaloids. Um, and so, you know, this was, this was, this was curious. Um, this led though to, to a series of, of other experiments where researchers said, well, you know what? Um, if they make these alkaloids, then you know, they've, they've, they've got to be able to build them somehow. And so there were a series of experiments that were done where researchers fed these frogs radioactive precursors. So radioactive um, acetate, uh, which uh, uh, mevalinate um, and cholesterol. So they fed you know, three, three things that were precursors we know to, to alkaloids and, and they were radio labeled. Um, and they fed them to him thinking that you would find these radio labeled precursors in the final alkaloids. Um, and there were a series of experiments that were done and sure enough, um, they didn't show up. There were none of these precursors in the frog alkaloids. And so, you know, people were like, well, huh, maybe this means they're not making it. Maybe we're using the wrong precursors. Um, you know, but we're sort of moving towards a little bit of uncertainty on, on where these, these alkaloids are, are coming from. At about the same time, or a little bit later, late 70s, middle 80s, um, uh, researchers unrelated to poison frogs, and, and mainly researchers in the temperate zone, so not even in tropical areas, uh, began to find that some of the alkaloids that were known from poison frogs were also found in arthropods. Um, and, the best example were ladybug beetles. Uh, ladybug beetles have these um, alkaloids called tricyclic alkaloids. Um, even the ladybug beetles here in Cleveland um, have these alkaloids in them. Um, and the frogs have these alkaloids as well. And researchers started to sort of see a connection maybe that, you know, well, look, these, these arthropods have these alkaloids and the frogs do. But there's a big disconnect because the frogs are largely in tropical areas and, and this research that was coming out was mainly in temperate areas. Uh, researchers also found that ants had alkaloids um, and some of the alkaloids that were in ants also were, were either similar or identical to the alkaloids in, in the frogs. And so this was sort of you know, a, a moment where people thought, hmm, I wonder if the frogs could be getting it from their diet but there was really a lot of resistance to this idea because as I started off, most frogs are producing their own poisons. Um, and so, you know, people thought this was interesting, um, but, but not, not super interesting. 
Um, I just want to say that I'm going to come back to these ladybug beetle alkaloids because um, this is part of the story here, but I want to come back to this because they are in the frogs, um, but I want to come back to the beetles in a few slides here. Now, the big piece of evidence, sort of the big part of the story here, the piece of evidence that led people to believe that these frogs were not producing alkaloids, but instead were getting them from what they were eating, came from a completely unexpected place. And that place is Hawaii. Hawaii um, is about 5,000 miles away from the nearest natural location of poison frogs. And it turns out that this unexpected place has to do with the fact that in 1932, an entomologist that was working in the territory of Hawaii, um, Hawaii wasn't a state until 1959. So in, in 1932, an entomologist who was working in Hawaii, um, and this person was working on um, biocontrol of invasive arthropods. So Hawaii was super concerned about all these invasive arthropods and in particular mosquitoes on the island. And so this entomologist got this idea that he could go to Panama and he could pick up some tropical frogs, which to him was these brightly colored poison frogs. And he introduced in 1932, 206 individual frogs from an island in Panama, collected them from Panama, brought them over to Hawaii, thinking that because these frogs were tropical, they would eat the mosquitoes in Hawaii and that would solve the problem. What he didn't know was that these frogs don't eat mosquitoes. So this turns out to be a terrible idea. Um, they are tropical frogs and there are mosquitoes in the tropics, but these frogs don't eat mosquitoes. Anyway, these frogs in Hawaii, they were introduced to Oahu. Um, these frogs ended up reproducing and ended up expanding um, into Hawaii. Um, and you know, they sat there for, for, for many years and nobody thought anything of it. In the 1980s and 1990s, researchers who were trying to figure out where poison frogs got their poisons from, decided that they would go to Hawaii and they would collect some of these poison frogs, some of these green and black poison frogs, and look at the alkaloids in the skin of these frogs and compare them to the alkaloids in Panama. We know where these frogs were collected from in Panama. And the idea was that even though 50 years had passed since the frogs were introduced to Hawaii, the idea was that the frogs in Hawaii should have the same alkaloids as the frogs in Panama. And what they found completely astounded them. What they found was that the alkaloids were completely different between the frogs in Hawaii and the parental frogs in Panama. These are two chemical profiles from that original paper in 1992. And what they're showing is each peak represents an alkaloid. And what you can see is that each of these um, spectra look completely different. The Panamanian population of frogs looks completely different in terms of what alkaloids it has as compared to the Hawaii population. And this was the big aha moment. This was the moment where researchers said, wait a second, these frogs must be eating something different in Hawaii than what they were eating in Panama. And this is what explains the difference in the alkaloids, right? This led then to a series of really critical experiments. This led to a series of experiments that wherein researchers fed frogs alkaloids and they demonstrated conclusively that these frogs are not making alkaloids, but instead are sequestering, from, sequestering these alkaloids from, from what they eat. And so these frogs are truly what they eat. They eat alkaloids and they're able to sequester these alkaloids into their poison glands. Now, since that time, We've learned that these frogs, these poison frogs, don't eat mosquitoes. Instead, what they eat is largely ants and mites. And so this is um, just an image of some stomach contents from frogs from Costa Rica. And these are tiny, tiny, tiny arthropods. These are all less than a millimeter in size. So this is really zoomed in. But this is what it would look like um, if you looked at a frog's stomach. 
Um, and what we've learned is not only do they eat mainly ants and mites, but ants and mites are little chemical factories. Um, this is just a, a trace of the kinds of compounds that are in ants. Um, and ants contain, you know, five to 10 different types of alkaloids in them. So these tiny little ants. And then the same thing for, for mites. These are, um, or this is a chemical profile here of, of small mites. Um, and, and these mites, again, are little chemical factories producing basically all of the alkaloids that we see in these poison frogs. Um, and so this is actually kind of neat. The frogs are, are eating these uh, different dietary sources, which gives them their, their alkaloid uh, defenses. Um, we've uh, begun to look closer at uh, what the arthropods are doing, um, you know, where are the arthropods getting these alkaloids, and it turns out that um, both ants and mites appear to manufacture the alkaloids. Um, I want to share with you some of uh, some new work that we've, we've done um, to demonstrate that mites are actually manufacturing alkaloids. Um, what we can do is we can feed mites um, the amino acid lysine um, and glucose, and we can radio label basically the, the lysine and, and glucose. Um, and what we find is that the mites manufacture the alkaloid. Um, and so you can see that the backbone of the alkaloid indicated by the red stars is from the amino acid lysine. And then the side chains on this disubstituted alkaloid, um, two, two side chains, um, comes from glucose, right? And this is um, here the alkaloid in the mite, the alkaloid being produced um, by the mite. So although the frogs are getting it from the mites and sequestering it, um, it looks like the mites, um, in fact, are making it. The other cool thing that I want to point out um, is this compound here, which is pretty common in mites. Um, this is that tricyclic compound that is found in beetles. And so originally, when researchers started to find alkaloids in arthropods, beetles were a big thing. And at the time, researchers thought, well, maybe frogs eat beetles. But it turns out that these frogs don't eat ladybug beetles. I looked at hundreds of frog stomachs, uh, maybe thousands, and you never find a ladybug beetle there. Um, it turns out that mites are also making the same alkaloid as beetles, and with respect to the frogs, the frogs are getting them from what appears to be um, mites, which is kind of cool. Um, so we know frogs are now sequestering these alkaloids from arthropods, and we know that arthropods are, are making them. Um, in my lab, we're, we're really interested in, in how frogs are uptaking the alkaloids. So, you know, we know they do it. We know that the alkaloids end up in glands. Um, we know a lot about where they're getting it from. Um, but we've started to explore um, how these frogs are able to move alkaloids from their diet into those glands. And we're using um, a really cool approach here. It's an, it's an imaging approach, a, a mass spectral imaging approach. Um, you don't need to know much about it, except that what you get as a result um, is an image that um, shows you where the alkaloid is. This is uh, very similar to imaging that we, you would use in medicine. Um, so like a, a CT scan or a PET scan. Um, the, the science is a little bit different, but, but what you're looking at here basically is a section of the frog um, and the areas that are in orange or red are showing the presence of alkaloid. Um, what you're looking at here is the section of the frog um, in, in, in a microscope so that we can determine where we're looking in the frog. And so what we see is that the mouth cavity is an area where the frogs begin to absorb the alkaloid. So as soon as they put the alkaloid in their mouth, they're able to start absorbing it. Um, that alkaloid moves through the digestive system. Uh, we find some of the alkaloid in liver, um, and we find a lot of the alkaloid in, in the stomach. Now, these alkaloids are lipophilic, they're fat soluble, and so they're moving through, at least we hypothesize, they're moving through the, the cell membrane in these areas. Uh, they're moving into what we presume is the bloodstream, and then they're being moved around the body of the frog um, possibly through transport proteins, and they're being taken to the poison glands. 
Um, if we look at other areas, um, we also find that the esophagus is an area where the frogs can uptake these alkaloids. Um, and then finally, um, the intestine as well is another area where the frogs uptake the alkaloids. And none of this is super surprising. I mean, obviously, if you're eating something and you're, you're sequestering it, it's going to come up through the digestive tract. Um, but, you know, these are the first steps for us to try to understand how the frogs are, are taking something that they're getting from their diet um, and basically putting it into their, their poison glands so that they can use them um, as, as a defense. Um, and this is just some neat, um, uh, some, some, a neat part of the story and, and sort of moving us forward with how the frogs are, are doing this. Um, adults are what we're talking about right now. We're talking about adults being able to, to sequester these alkaloids from ants and mites. Um, but adults are really only part of the story, right? The story gets way cooler. Um, this is an adult frog here. Um, and what's on the back of this frog is a tadpole. Um, and I want to sort of take the story into a different life stage of these frogs um, and talk a little bit about alkaloids and tadpoles. Um, the real reason though that adults are only part of the story has to do with some of the biology of these frogs. Um, it turns out that some dendrobatids protect their offspring. Um, and we refer to this as parental care. Um, this is really common in mammals. Um, this is uh, a snow monkey basically caring for her, her young. Um, this is known in birds. Uh, birds take care of their chicks. Um, but uh, this parental care, this type of parental care, um, is not unique to mammals and birds. It's actually really common in frogs, and it's really common in dendrobatid frogs. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and tell you a neat story here. Um, this is a uh, an evolutionary relationship of dendrobatid frogs. Um, it turns out actually that there are over 300 species of dendrobatid frogs, but of those 300 species, only about 60 of them contain alkaloids and only about 60 of them are able to sequester alkaloids. So again, we're talking about this lineage in Central and South America, um, and this is just how the groups of these frogs are related to each other. Um, and then, you know, only a subset of them are able to, to sequester these alkaloids. And so that's what we're, we're talking about here. But I want to focus in on, on one group of these frogs. Um, and this is a group that um, is named Oophaga. And the word Oophaga is Greek for egg eater. And it turns out that all of the tadpoles in this group of frogs feed exclusively on eggs for development. So basically for them to grow um, from tadpoles to frogs, they only eat eggs. And those eggs come exclusively from mom. And so moms or mothers in the genus Oophaga end up feeding their tadpoles unfertilized egg. This is a species that we spend a lot of time studying in my lab, Oophaga pumilio. This species has extremely complex parental care. Males in this species guard fertilized eggs. Reproduction in this species takes place on the forest floor. Males and females will get together. Males, uh, sorry, females will deposit eggs and males will deposit sperm onto those eggs for fertilization. And this happens in a wet leaf, basically. Um, the males will hang around for about seven to 10 days. And that's the time it takes from those eggs to develop into tadpoles. Um, the female leaves for that period of time. After about seven to 10 days, the female returns to where the tadpoles are, the tadpoles wiggle up onto the back of the female, and the female takes the tadpoles to plants in the forest called bromeliads. And so this is a bromeliad. And bromeliads have axles, um, and this is the inside of one axle that fills with water. And what she does is she backs into the axle and she deposits her tadpoles into there. And so the tadpoles end up living in 
developing in a very, very small volume of water. They live in this body of water, the tadpoles do, for about six weeks. And during that entire six week period, the females return on a daily basis to feed her tadpoles an unfertilized egg. And this is really, really neat. She comes back, she knows where they live, and she gives them an unfertilized egg. And this is all they eat for six weeks, the tadpoles, until they become frogs. Right, so this is really, really extensive um, parental care. Um, we study this um, in the field by creating artificial breeding sites. And so this is really high-tech science here. We have small cups and some disposable knives that we tie to trees. Um, we drill holes in the top of the cup so that the cups can fill with water, but not overfill. And it turns out if you put these in the right place, females think that they're bromeliads. Well, I'm not sure they think they're bromeliads, but they use them just like they would a bromeliad and they deposit their tadpoles in there and they'll return uh, regularly to feed them. Now, even crazier is that the tadpoles beg for mom to give them eggs, right? They basically ask mom to provide them eggs. And I wanna show you a video from a colleague of mine, Dr. Jennifer Steinowski, who's at the University of Costa Rica, who has some video here of a tadpole begging mom to give her some eggs. So what you see here is a tadpole vibrating as mom is in the water with her. And this vibration is the cue that mom uses to deposit eggs. You'll see here in the next frame, the mom is going to start to deposit eggs. So here are eggs that mom is releasing so that the tadpoles can feed on them. And there you go, you can see those two eggs. So this is in the lab, this video. I also wanna show you a video of this happening um, in the field. So these are those cups that I told you that moms will use. And this is a female who's gonna jump into a cup where she's got tadpoles. And you can see the tadpole swimming around. Um, she's already deposited some eggs. You can't see it as well, but she's vibrating, or sorry, the tadpole is vibrating to try to release eggs. And there's the tadpole and you can see the eggs that mom has deposited, right? So um, basically these tadpoles are completely dependent on mom um, for this food source. Now, this is mom caring for her young. This is mom basically providing food for her, her young developing tadpoles. Um, what's interesting about this situation is that these tadpoles are still prone to predation. These tadpoles um, can get preyed on by spiders and snakes and ants. Um, and so they're not um, you know, out of harm's way because they're in these little cups or in these bromeliads. Um, but what mom does, which is actually kind of neat, is mom puts in those eggs that she's feeding to her young, she puts in those eggs alkaloids. She basically consumes alkaloids from arthropods, uses them in her own defense, but then is able to put those alkaloids in eggs, and these are just some eggs from mom, that's what they look like. Um, she puts those alkaloids in the eggs and then the tadpoles feed on those alkaloids and they themselves get alkaloid defenses. So this is neat. Mom is providing eggs for food, but mom is also providing eggs for um, defense for these tadpoles. Now the tadpoles, because they live in these little bromeliads, they don't have access to the ants and mites that mom has access to. Right, and so they're completely dependent on mom, not just for food so they can develop, but they're also dependent on mom for their alkaloid defenses. It turns out that if you look at tadpoles as they develop, so this is a graph of alkaloid quantity and then the development of tadpoles. So as you move from left to right, tadpoles are getting older what we see is a steady increase in the amount of alkaloid that is in a tadpole. 
And this is because mom is feeding them on a daily basis and she's only giving them a little alkaloid every time. But over time, over the course of six weeks, those tadpoles begin to accumulate alkaloids. And so very young tadpoles, and so these are the young tadpoles here, and I just have this area of the graph zoomed in up here because it's pretty tight. And so you can see the young tadpoles have an increase in the alkaloids that are in them. So as they grow larger, they get more, or they, they, they have more and more alkaloids. And this is all because of mom, right? Mom is doing this for them. She's basically providing them alkaloids. And so when we talk about you are what you eat with these poison frogs, it's true that the adults are getting these from arthropods, but it's also true that the tadpoles are getting them from mom and they're getting them through what they're eating from mom. Older tadpoles have more alkaloids and these um, higher amounts of alkaloids we've shown experimentally um, provide better protection against predators. Two very common predators in this system are these really large spiders called tenid spiders, um, and then these very large ants. These ants are over an inch long, so these are not your standard ant. Um, these ants called bullet ants, they prey on tadpoles. Um, and these tadpoles are, are protected to some extent from these types of predators because mom provides them with alkaloids. So, so here we are, um, you know, basically at the end, um, I, I, you know, started with poison frogs. They are small organisms that are brightly colored and poisonous. Um, you now know that they get their poisons from what they're eating, which is largely uh, ants and mites. And you know that in some cases, moms are able to provide their offspring also with chemical defenses because their offspring can't get them um, at that point. Um, and so this is a little bit into the life of, of poison frogs. And I wanna end um, by taking this a, a step further. Um, and I wanna end by saying that alkaloids are not always an effective defense, right? Because what we're talking about here are frogs that are basically uh, poisonous because they're, they're, they're using those poisons against different types of predators, right? Um, and, you know, in some cases, mom is giving them to their tadpoles. But just because these frogs are poisonous doesn't mean that certain predators can't still eat them. So I want to end with the fact that maybe this idea of what you eat, or you are what you eat, I should say, extends beyond just poison frogs. And these are two examples of predators that can feed on alkaloid-containing poison frogs. This is a mot mot here. This is a relatively common bird um, that if you zoom in to its beak, there it is feeding on a poison frog. Um, it's feeding on this poison frog. Um, but what's even more interesting is that this particular observation, this mot mot was feeding poison frogs to its chicks. And so not only is the adult mot mot protected, but apparently also the chicks are protected. And then here on the right, this is a pink belly litter snake that is feeding also on a poison frog. It's got it in its mouth and it will soon consume that poison frog. And in both cases here, the bird and the snake appear to have no ill effects from the alkaloids. And so what I'm proposing as a possibility here is that you are what you eat isn't just about poison frogs, but it's possible that these birds and these snakes are they themselves sequestering the alkaloids from the poison frogs, possibly using them as a chemical defense as well. And I think this because there's a precedent for this. There are other birds and other snakes that are capable of doing this, not with respect to poison frogs, but other types of poisonous um, organisms. And so this might be yet another case of that. So you are what you eat, and poison frogs become poisonous because of what they eat. And so I will end there and I'll say thank you all for attending and I'm more than happy uh, to take any questions that you have. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise with us. We are greatly appreciative of it. Um, we do have two questions from the chat. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. One goes back to one of the things you had mentioned earlier about mites and um, about mites. And if they are the one and ants, I should say as well, if they create alkaloids, are they poisonous to other creatures? Potentially, yes. Um, I think that there's some evidence that many frogs avoid eating certain ants and mites, and it might be because they themselves are poisonous. Okay. And then were the Hawaiian frogs poisonous? And if so, what did they eat in comparison to the, the group that was over in Panama? So yeah, the Hawaiian frogs were poisonous. The Hawaiian frogs had alkaloids. Um, I had an opportunity to return to Hawaii uh, 10 years ago, which would have been um, you know, maybe uh, 15 years after um, the last person was there. And, and we did some work to figure out what those Hawaiian frogs were eating. Um, and it turns out they're eating ants and mites that are um, in some cases endemic to Hawaii. So they're only found in Hawaii. And then one last question that just kind of hit me, and then uh, I know we, we've kind of, we've, we've overextended our time uh, with, you know, we, uh, and we appreciate you sharing your, you know, all of this, because it really is fascinating. I'm really interested in the, the parental care of the o ophasia. Uh-huh, oophaga. Oophaga. Is that unique to that one species, or is, is that something throughout, you know, multiple um, groups of, of frogs? It's, it's, uh, it's not unique to this lineage of frogs. Um, the specifics about the alkaloid transfer is pretty unique, but that type of parental care is not unique to this group, no. Okay. Many and then frogs. one last question from the chat since we have it. Yeah. What type of instrumentation do you use here at the university? Uh, we use uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. That's the main instrument we use. Um, we use infrared spectrometry. Uh, we use a little bit of um, uh, liquid chromatography, um, and we plan to at some point use um, the NMR, the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Instrument. So we use quite a few different things, but the main thing we use is uh, GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Awesome. So if for people who are interested in learning more about your research, is there a way that they can follow what you're doing um, with our students here at John Carroll? Yeah, I have a website, a research website, um, and I uh, can send that to you and you can you can post it somewhere um, or somebody can send me an email and I can give them the address to that website. Great. Well, thank you again, Ralph, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, John Carroll University is incredibly fortunate to have you um, within our community and teaching our students to become change agents and leaders um, in, in our society. So thank you again. Um, before we, uh, and I want to share a few more um, programs that we have coming up that may be of interest to you um, and, your, and your friends within the John Carroll community. So on Monday, April 12th, the university is hosting a panel discussion entitled Call to Serve, Leadership Through COVID-19 and Beyond. The program will be moderated by Caitlin Huey Burns, political reporter for CBS and a member of the class of 2009. The panel will feature three alumni who are all making significant contributions in their given fields as we battle COVID-19. Dr. Michael Anderson, class of 86, who is senior advisor to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Eric Beck, uh, DO of, from the class of 04, is the chief operating officer at University Hospitals Health System. And Dr. Martina Moore, a graduate alum from the class of 2001, who is president and CEO of more counseling and um, mediation services and a member of JCU's faculty. On Thursday, April 15th, the Department of Political Science welcomes the Honorable John Cranley, Mayor of Cincinnati and a member of the JCU class of 1996 as part of the Suopus Lecture Series. Mayor Cranley will speak on how Cincinnati has battled COVID-19 and what gives them hope as our communities emerge from the pandemic. And on Monday, May, uh, April 19th, Join us as we celebrate the 135th anniversary of JCU's founding. While this year we will celebrate virtually, we will still honor its Jesuit heritage and how it inspires individuals to excel in learning, leadership, and service in their communities. We are incredibly fortunate to have the very Reverend Timothy Kosicki from the Society of Jesus and a member of the class of 1984 with us for that program. Father Kosicki serves as the president of the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States. <laughs> 
You can find more information and register for all of our upcoming programs, including our alumni author series, scholarly luncheons, alumni continuing education series, and our alumni spotlight events um, at jcu.edu backslash alumni. Additionally, we invite you to join uh, to view the recordings of our previous programs on the JCU Alumni Association YouTube channel. To view our extensive library, search for John Carroll University Alumni on YouTube. Finally, please consider a charitable, charitable gift to John Carroll in support of our students, our outstanding faculty, and our entire campus community. If you've already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. If you have not, please join me in supporting J JCU so that we can continue to deliver an outstanding education for our current and future blue streaks. You can make a donation by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Thank you again for joining us this, this afternoon. Take care, be well, stay safe, and onward on. John Carroll.